The global drive to transition to zero emission energy is at the heart of tackling climate change. To achieve the turnaround towards carbon neutrality, countries need to take much more ambitious action in this decade. One of the key fields of action is the transition of the energy sector from fossil to renewable fuels, while also becoming drastically more energy efficient. The solutions exist. It is now our responsibility to implement them and ensure the successful global energy transition. Now is the time to turn words into action. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We continue now with our first ministerial panel on how we rise to the challenge that all of our opening speakers have described, how we turn words into action and shape a way forward that will get us where we need to go quickly. And ladies and gentlemen, here in the Weltsaal, if I may ask you to please take your seats, I'd be very grateful because we can then continue and perhaps we can start closing the doors to the room so that we have uh, somewhat more quiet in the room. As we have heard, the remainder of this decade is absolutely crucial. The most recent UNE emissions gap report reveals that commitments to reach net zero by 2050 will limit global warming to, to just over two degrees only if countries act on them now by scaling up their nationally determined contributions, their action plans for 2030. The energy transition is absolutely key to doing that, and nowhere more so than amongst the heavyweight economies that are assembled here in this room and also on this stage. Not only their enormous share of global primary energy consumption, but also their massive combined financial resources mean that their efforts will decide whether we succeed or fail in closing the temperature gap. So how do we effectively accelerate the shift to clean energy? How do we phase coal out faster? And how do we take citizens along, ensuring a just and equitable transition? Those are some of the topics on this panel, and we have an outstanding group of speakers to address them. It is a great pleasure to welcome them. I will keep the introductions brief in the interest of time, and I'm going to ask all of you, uh, dear excellencies, to please do the same in your answers, to try to keep your remarks to the allotted time of two minutes. And now, it's a pleasure to welcome His Excellency Arifin Tazrif. He is Minister for Energy and Mineral Resources of Indonesia. Seated next to him, His Excellency Abu Bakr Di Aliu. He is Minister of Power for Nigeria. Next to him is seated Her Excellency, Dr. Leila Ben Ali, Minister of the Energy Transition and Sustainable Development for the Kingdom of Morocco. And next to her is seated His Excellency, Dr. Ahmed Mohina. He is Deputy Minister and Head of Strategic Planning and International Cooperation for Egypt. And finally, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Christian Bruch. He's President and Chief Executive Officer of Siemens Energy. And with us virtually is Her Excellency Kadri Simpson. She is Commissioner for Energy at the European Commission. Dear ladies and gentlemen, both those of you with us here in the Weltsaal and also our online audience, we are also eager to hear from you with your questions and short comments. Our Twitter hashtag, as you know, is BETD2022. You can join our interactive discussions there by commenting or posing questions. And if you're a registered guest at the conference, you can use our digital tool for which you received a login at the time of registering to send us questions and also to vote on our audience polls. And I'd like to start with a really quick poll and then we'll look at the results a little bit later. Here's our poll question. How to enable change and increase the momentum for urgent energy transition action? And here are our choices. Support more ambitious NDCs. Amplify the role of nuclear energy. Promote a flexible power system fit for future challenges. And or, or help countries adopt the best policies to accelerate investments in the clean energy sector. And of course, we've heard all of those mentioned so far um, this morning. And we're going to take another look at the results a little bit later on. I'd like to now begin by asking all of our panel participants to tell us 
quite concretely how your country or your company is prioritizing transformation of the energy sector over the next eight years to 2030 and how you're rising to the challenge named in our title of transforming ambition into action. And uh, I'll begin, if I may, with Minister Ben Ali. Morocco, of course, is recognized as one of the pioneers of the African energy vendor, and you have significantly transformed your energy industry in recent years. So tell us what you see as the main challenges for going from ambition to action. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning. I'll try to be brief uh, as, as you required, and, but I would like to first thank the federal government, the federal government of Germany for inviting us uh, to this wonderful uh, and first in-presence meeting. Um, I, I will not spend too much time to talk about Morocco's commitments. I mean, we've, we've been committed to, uh, our, to the climate change issue, I think, more than 15 years ago. And this was a really voluntarist political choice made by His Majesty the King, uh, Mohammed VI, at the time, to put Morocco on the path of sustainable development. And that's the reason why today you have indeed the Ministry of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development that I'm uh, having the privilege of, 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 sh of sharing and leading. Um, I think when we talk about what is happening today, and I think during these difficult times and the war that we have in Ukraine today and in this trying to get post-COVID recovery uh, on stage, I think the acceleration of energy transition is really a must. And Morocco as a country has been experiencing that uh, at our level. So we are definitely committed more than ever. And I need to remind you of uh, our NDCs because that's in, in June 2021, uh, Morocco <clears throat> has submitted this updated NDC with a new ambition of 45.5% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2030. Uh, and my team here would like to remind ourselves, would like to remind me always that we are one of the few countries that submitted an NDC that is compatible with the global objective of reduction of global temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So, uh, I think keyword number one is transparency of our NDC. We have indeed initiated initiated some t substantive work in the past. I will not want to spend a lot of time on the past. I really want to focus on the future. Uh, Morocco uh, has uh, had the privilege of uh, being the president of the United Nations Environment Assembly in Nairobi, Kenya, four weeks ago. That sets even higher expectations in our journey for an energy transition for sustainable development. We are in the process of developing, of course, our low carbon development strategy for 2030 and 2050. But again, we want to put words into action when we do that. And that's definitely in line with our new development model, something that uh, we put together over the last couple of years simply because we wanted to get away from the middle income trap. So our sustainable development strategy is definitely in line with our new development model. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think I would, I would finish with a couple of words stating that indeed today there are some numbers that are important to us. 52% uh, of installed capacity based on renewables by t before 2030, that's our target. Indeed, we have 50 renewable energy projects now uh, up and running, four gigawatts installed. We have more than 60 projects in the pipeline. As I said at COP26, that is not enough. And that is not enough for two reasons. First, Morocco, as you know, has a, a stable political framework. But we don't, we don't really have that. We also have, as you know, quite uh, a competitive renewable potential. But that's not enough indeed. I think we are working on that more stable yet evolving regulatory framework and contractual framework. Uh, and we have for renewable energy and hydrogen, a one-stop shop that is here. Uh, our director at the ministry, Mr. Ahmed, uh, when you want to meet uh, a Moroccan minister for, for investments, I think uh, it's better to meet our one-stop shop when it comes to <laughs> renewable uh, investments. So he's there. You don't need to meet me, you need to meet him. <laughs> Uh, but as Minister Babek mentioned, I think we have also something invaluable from a policymaker's perspective. We also made mistakes. 
we also made the first movers mistakes when it comes to investments, in, particularly in renewable energy. And we are learning from those mistakes. So I think that's lesson number one. And I would echo this conference theme, um, less words, more action. I would love it if one day, if, if from Berlin, we stop using the word green hydrogen and we start to use the word $2 hydrogen, because I think that will bring in together the, finance, the financial community, the investors, the policymakers, and so on. And last message, at COP26, uh, we agreed, Morocco adhered to most of the political declaration initiatives, including the power in past coal. But I said at the time, but power in past coal also means access to sustainable sources of gas, access to the international LNG market. At the time, we used Ukraine as a benchmark because Ukraine reversed some pipelines with its neighbors. I never thought at the time that history will be faster, that history will prove us right. And so I, I just say, let's focus on an integrated approach, an inclusive approach, and let's be faster than history. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to take... Uh, with me your remark about $2 coal, uh, $2 hydrogen, when we go to our hydrogen panel later on today. Thank you so much. Minister Tasleef, as the current G20 president, Indonesia is, of course, also a beacon for other emerging economies. So please tell us about your beacon strategy to achieve a higher renewable energy share by 2025. Yeah, thank you. Well, um since we signed the Paris Agreement and then we ratified into our law that we continue to prepare our roadmap how to reduce the CO2 emission in our country. As you know, Indonesia is producing, we are blessed that we have uh, big resources of oil, gas, even the coal, that we help yeah, our friend countries to, to, to supply them with the energy. But right now, we, are, we realize that the future, we need a clean energy to, to have a better, uh, better uh, climate in, in our life. So uh, in order to accelerate the things, uh, in 2000, by 2025, we try to reach at least 25% of our energy mix. Recently, we just have 11.7%. We have 72 uh, gigawatt power plant capacity, which is, uh, we have 38 gigawatt of uh, uh, coal-based power plant. So we have an intention within the next five years, we are going to shut down at least 5.5 5 .5 gigawatt of this coal power plant, and then we try to substitute it yeah, with the uh, renewable energy. We did several act, uh, activities on it, yeah, so as it is mentioned in the, in the subject, that uh, from ambition to to action, we do uh, several, several, several programs. For instance, that uh, we are tropical countries, we want to accelerate the power, uh, solar power PV. Yeah, uh, we, we plan to develop uh, 7.8, almost 8 uh, gigawatt within the next 10 years. So at, at the other side, we also uh, have the program to uh, intensify the use of electric electric uh, vehicles. Uh, last couple of weeks, uh, we just launched a new, uh, the first production of the electric vehicles. And then also we have a program to convert our motorcycle. Motorcycle is very popular in Indonesia. So we, we think uh, we have a plan to convert it within the next 10 years, about 120 millions, which is the consumption of the fuel itself equivalent to 1.5 uh, million barrel oil per day. So we can save a lot of, uh, uh, we can save a lot of uh, fuel. And then uh, that's why renewable clean energy is very important in our country. So this activity only will create such a lot of uh, uh, economic activity in our country. So when we're talking about uh, how much required to convert this kind of motorcycle, we, thought, we, we think about 60 to 80 billion US dollars will be required to convert it. And there are another, another program also now we are, uh, we are being prepared. 
Thank you very much. And we're going to come back uh, to the topic you mentioned at the outset, uh, coal. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. But let me go now to Minister Aliyu. And climate change is happening now in Nigeria. How does that impact the way that you are shaping the energy transition plan to define a pathway to net zero while you also lift millions of people out of poverty and drive economic growth? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you for inviting me today. Uh, accelerating the energy transition may mean uh, differently to uh, the approach. I mean, may be different from country to country. Uh, but generally, it may mean uh, phasing out the carbon uh, generation in the general supply of uh, electricity. Uh, in my country, Nigeria, the way we are approaching it is uh, we have a serious challenge with our national grid. The national grid can only be able to uh, meet up with uh, less than 60% of demand of electricity in Nigeria. So uh, the left-out demands are being... Uh, resorted to using uh, fossil uh, fuel generation with personal small generators, uh, firewood, and things like that, which also contribute to the uh, carbon emission. So our approach is to, first of all, strengthen our grid to be able to carry uh, a lot of uh, operational capacity so that uh, most of the population will come back to the grid. Now, alongside, we are also developing renewable energies to ramp up uh, on the grid. Uh, so we can only do that if the grid is strong to carry that. So we have projects going on in the renewable energy, like uh, 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 700 megawatts uh, solar and the water uh, hydroelectricity. Uh, which is over 90% completion now. We have a 40 megawatt hydro, which is already completed. We have uh, uh, another one, uh, which is 40 megawatts. Uh, among other ones, uh, like the uh, solar isolated uh, mini grids spread across the country. But all this can come to the grid only when the grid is strong enough to carry uh, all the mixes. So we uh, have a policy which uh, is our vision of 30, 30, 30 signed by the government. Uh, and that means uh, by, 30, 30, uh, by 2030, we should be able to upgrade the operational capacity to 30 megawatts. And 30% of that must come from renewable. And uh, uh, our president also uh, made a declaration at COP26 uh, that by 2060, uh, we should be net zero by 2060. And uh, we have developed our own pathway, which we are working towards that. Our transition fuel up to uh, 2030 is going to be gas, which we are uh, working towards uh, policy to make investors do more of the gas than the uh, other fossil. So mm -hmm. this is our way we approach the, the uh, energy transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me pick up uh, with you, uh, Deputy Minister Mohina, on the point about grid stability, because in fact, Egypt uh, also has rapidly rising demand for power. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you plan to achieve a 42% renewable share by 2035, uh, which is uh, your goal, and at the same time ensure a flexible power system. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and first, I would like to uh, uh, 
to tell you the apologize for His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Shaker, the Minister of Electricity and Renewable Energy. I, I participated today on behalf of him because he would like to participate, but unfortunately, due to some you know, sudden circumstances, he couldn't uh, uh, arrive and he couldn't uh, leave Cairo. And if you please let me uh, shift to Arabic uh, uh, language because it's my language. Any, uh, may you use uh, the headphone, please? Exactly. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, you will need your headsets if you are not an Arabic speaker. We'll just give them 30 seconds to get those headsets on. And by the way, I have my translation right here in my ear, so uh, I am listening to every word you say. <laughs> في الحقيقة يعني موضوع الانرجي ترانزيشن يعني اصبح النهارده حتمي وضروري وخاصة بعد باريس اجريمنت اللي مصر وقعت عليها وراتيفايد في 2015 ومنذ ذلك التاريخ Yeah, we also entered into commitments uh, in 2015 and since Egypt has launched a very um, ambitious climate change program, we wanted to put together a strategy for climate change mitigation for an, an inclusive change towards renewables. Uh, 42% this is our goal by 2035. It's a very ambitious goal and this also requires ambitious measures that we need to implement. Of course, we have changed many of our rules and we have revised our laws and um, created new laws uh, in order to create the necessary regulatory framework. And so, for instance, we have given more rights to investors with regard to land use because um, investors can now uh, also invest from abroad into renewables. We also made agreements um, um, for the purchase of energies um, over a time period of 25 years, so long-term agreements. And luckily, in 2021 uh, and for 2022, we were able to achieve our midterm goal. So uh, we have reached a, a share of 22% of renewables in these two years. As regards uh, the mod uh, modernizing of our energy system in Egypt, we were able to reach achieve more than 50 percent. In the 50 percent, we were able to replace the use of uh, coal and fossil fuels by renewables. But we could only achieve this based on the political support from the government in Egypt. So we were able to launch the largest solar project in the Middle East and Northern Africa. We're talking about 20 megawatts and 32 private sector investors are involved. So uh, and it also has a very interesting cost structure for the investors. So there was a lot of involvement from the private sector um, within Egypt and from abroad. It has been a very attractive project. A two cents for a kilowatt hour of solar energy and a very good price for wind energy could be achieved. So this um, reflects the great opportunities for renewables in Egypt. Our plan for 2035 also uh, reflects this. And now we have to look at the challenges that we have already overcome in the past and the ones that we still need to face. Now, even though we have a very promising project for the storage, of energy as we have launched such a program, are we currently trying to foster other technologies uh, for energy storage in order to be able to even um, increase, expand our targets? We want to, we are looking at green hydrogen. 
When we um, expand and further develop this new te technology, then this is a great opportunity for the shift towards renewables. And we can build electrical inter as well, connections with other countries. We also need technical standards that have to be uh, agreed on. And also the system operators in the neighboring countries, for instance, in, in, in Jordan, and uh, we have to work together with the Arab network, Libya, and in the south with Sudan and Saudi Arabia. So we are also connected uh, to, the, to the grid um, via Cyprus and Greece. So we will also provide input there um, and we will also uh, feed in renewables there. Thank you very, very much. And in fact, I want to try to come back to the topic of international cooperation uh, at the close of our panel if we, if we have the time. Let me go now to Commissioner Simpson, if I may. And I'm not sure if you uh, were able to hear much of our opening ceremony, Commissioner, but in fact, we heard both from the German Foreign Minister and the Minister for Economy and Climate that not only Germany, but also Europe as a whole must drastically accelerate the clean energy transition, also with the aim of boosting energy security and independence here in Europe. So how are you at EU level making that happen? Where, what time frame do you think is actually feasible for this enormous shift? And where do you see the biggest challenges? And all of that briefly, if you would. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. And th uh, thank you for allowing me to join virtually to this panel uh, from Brussels. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, join you for the opening uh, speeches, uh, but I had a chance to meet Minister Habak uh, yesterday uh, at the margin of uh, G7 extraordinary meeting uh, of energy ministers, so uh, we are aligned. And, and of course, the global energy landscape has uh, changed uh, drastically in recent weeks. But for us, uh, while it may change our tactics, our strategy in the EU remains the same. We have an objective to become climate neutral, reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And this goal has been enshrined in EU law. And Russia's war against Ukraine has only confirmed that our strategy is sound. Um, the green transition is actually the only way to ensure secure, affordable and sustainable energy all at the same time. So our response has been to move even faster in this direction. So reducing our dependency on uh, uh, fossil fuels and on Russian fossil fuels in particular. And in the short perspective, we will diversify our um, supply routes. But lasting solution is to accelerate the deployment of renewables and, uh, and um, also well, to produce more renewable hydrogen and, of course, to improve our energy efficiency. So we will save where we can. And at global level, I believe that uh, we can be more ambitious when we work together on common goals. The Paris Agreement is uh, the best example. It is keeping us uh, on track to the 1.5 degrees. It is pushing all of us to have more ambition. And relying on our international cooperation partners um, is vital. Um, it is vital also for our Green Deal. And this is why we are strong supporters of multilateral cooperation in the area of energy through IRENA and the International Energy Agency and the Clean Energy Ministerial or Mission Innovation. So all these entities that catalyze international cooperation on energy. And in addition, we are committed to support emerging and developing countries to achieve the global energy transition and um, to reach our global, global energy and climate goals, we cannot, of course, work alone. So we must reinforce um, our alliances and we must create new ones. And for the European Union, Africa is a clear geographical priority for um, accelerating access to sustainable energy in the next decade. And, um, and Africa is also an important partner for us to make the green transition happen in the EU. Um, I believe there is a win-win situation in the EU-Africa relationship in the field of energy. So, so uh, this continent has enormous potential in the production of renewable uh, hydrogen, and the uh, EU is interested um, about uh, these kind of partnerships. Uh, and in the coming months, we will be working on uh, building new hydrogen partnerships uh, with, uh, with our um, 
uh, well, partner countries. And I hope that uh, this cooperation will also help Africa to provide its citizens with secure and affordable access to energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. And I'm still hoping, as I said, to come back to the, and dig a di- 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 bit deeper on the question of cooperation. Dr. Buch, we've heard a very palpable sense of urgency here this morning on the energy transition. Would you say that same sense of urgency is being felt by industry? And how do you see the risks uh, in this accelerated timetable for reducing dependence, particularly on natural gas? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me on the panel. First of all, um, the first answer would be absolutely yes. I think we shouldn't underestimate uh, the speed and the pressure which is in the industry. Also simply, uh, if you see where the investments are going to. Um, the key is then how do you turn it into action, right? I mean, the, um, the one thing is about raising ambitions, but for me, um, I miss at the moment really concrete actions over the next years, right? And really changing things. We committed as a company ourselves to be carbon neutral by 2030 in scope one and scope two. We are working, being 100% fed by renewable energy next year. So we are trying to implement these things because only a sustainable company will be investable going forward. Uh, So the pressure is absolutely high in the industry. Um, and this alignment between industry and policymakers is, is really, really crucial. Um, however, we are also a company which is confronted afterwards to implement things. Um, and we are obviously a company which is cutting across all type of energies, from renewables like wind power, Siemens Gamesa was mentioned before, to gas power or building the uh, infrastructure like the electrical grid in between. And um, at the moment, what we see is there is today in the industry and in the politics no price for sustainability. I mean, our energy infrastructure has been built on the cheapest power price. Right? And if we want to change it, we need to have a discussion in the society that we are willing to accept that. It's not an economic or not a company issue. It's a societal issue. We also do not have a technology problem of driving energy transformation. We have a society discussion. And we also have to be clear that also from our company perspective, we need to redirect investments into the areas where we need it. It was mentioned before, I think, that uh, the amount of money you require for energy carbon neutral world is around $50 trillion, 70% in developing countries. So if we don't change these mechanisms, it will not work. And this is, I think, the same for politics and companies, but the heat is absolutely on. I can today convince no investor to invest in my company if I don't have a clear plan on how do I drive energy transformation as an energy company. Thank you very much. Uh, You outlined some crucial priorities. Let's take a look at what the audience said earlier in answer to our poll about how to enable change and increase momentum. Could we get a look at those results, please, Uh, those uh, who are? So let's take a look. Um, The first answer that I'm seeing here, how help countries adopt the best policies to accelerate investment, 61 percent. See, that is the absolute key driver, accelerating investment and the policies to do so. Second uh, largest share would be 31 percent saying promote a flexible power system, which several of you mentioned. Then a very small share uh, saying amplify the role of nuclear energy, interestingly enough, uh, six percent on that. And Supporting more ambitious NDCs, only 2%. I'm hoping that Dr. Uh, Mohina is taking note of that because, of course, his country will be chairing the next COP. And uh, I'm sure you would have maybe hoped and expected to see a larger share. But we're going to come back to that in just a moment. We have now about 15 minutes left, I'm sorry to say, for the rest of the topics that I would like to try to discuss. So I'm going to ask all of you to be really very brief, if you would, and I want to start with the question of coal, because of course, uh, reducing coal has been a key objective also at the COP26, uh, trying to uh, boost countries' speed in shifting toward the end of coal. And I'd like to go, if I may, to Commissioner Simpson 
Simpson, again, with the request for a brief answer. The current geopolitical crisis, Commissioner, is it a setback? Could we actually see not a phase out, but in fact a phase in of coal as countries move to try to get off of Russian natural gas? Well, no, I, I think that uh, our solution is uh, to fasten our transition. And, and of course, we know that uh, this transition um, will affect this pro disproportionately some countries and some regions and some sectors. Uh, but, uh, but, well, we have to well, um, tackle these negative consequences and we need, uh, these need to be addressed. Uh, we are ready to do so. And, well, our plan, this Repower EU plan, it actually um, um, is built to the previous um, uh, uh, proposals. So we have a compre comprehensive approach in place. Uh, we are supporting uh, regions that rely on fossil fuels uh, by just transition mechanism. So we will protect our most vulnerable consumers, but then we will support renewables. We will uh, provide uh, alternatives uh, that are uh, homegrown and, uh, and of course, just transition is a key uh, also globally. And, uh, and the current situation on energy markets created by Russia's uh, aggression has made one thing clear, that uh, the energy transition is important, not only to combat climate change, but also to safeguard access to energy and keep it affordable. So, uh, so to accelerate the shift away from fossil fuel um, to clean energy um, is necessary, and, uh, and this is what we are doing here in Europe and uh, where we are willing to support our partners globally. Minister Tazarif, your country is one of the biggest coal exporters in the world. Um, at the COP26, you in fact signed up to the global coal to clean power transition statement that would commit you to phase out unabated coal power in the 2040s. What are the biggest challenges that you face, briefly if you would? Yeah, I think uh, we are, yeah, as you mentioned, that we are biggest, uh, one of the biggest coal producers. And our usage in our country is only 25% from what is our produce annually. So 75% we help uh, other our countries to, to support their energy uh, requirement. Well, uh, there should be a strong commitment yeah, from all the countries to reduce their uh, coal consumption, even to eliminate their coal use. So uh, every country, they have their own program, they have their, their own roadmap. So I think uh, it should, it's, this, there should be a common, common goal. So in our country itself, if uh, we have to retire our coal power plant, yeah, uh, following the contractual basis, it has to be, uh, if, if it will really be finished by 2056. But right now there is an initiative from uh, several financial institutions that uh, to accelerate the coal uh, retirement. So we are being discussing with several uh, financial institutions to, to reduce it. The other problem that we are facing with is about the workers who are working in the mining sectors. So we have to prepare such kind of uh, program yeah, in order to how, how to make them survive after they lost the job. So this is a big challenge. But mm -hmm. as uh, I mentioned to you, we are in the target to reach the nature emission by 2060. And then we are also thanks that we blessed with a big source of renewable in our country. And thank you for so much for mentioning uh, the challenge of finding jobs uh, for displaced workers. I'd like to come back to the social side of the energy transition in a moment. But let me first go to Dr. Bruch to ask you about another big challenge associated with getting off not only coal, but also other fossil fuel resources, namely stranded assets, legacy assets, valuable existing power plants, infrastructure that were designed for fossil fuels and coal. Do they simply have to be written off, or to what degree can we truly repurpose something like uh, coal-associated uh, uh, assets? No, I think that you, you can do a lot, and I think we should be smart of using existing infrastructure to have a sensible way forward. I mean, obviously, we particularly at the moment, uh, coal is one thing, the other thing is gas, obviously, and how do we make sure that we can have a smart coal to gas and then gas to renewable transition? And you can 
convert gas turbines to hydrogen injection, ammonia, and green ammonia injection, and gradually, obviously, use it afterwards to stabilize a grid, which has a higher intake of renewable power, and still have a low or no emissions then in the backup operation where needed. So there are smart ways to do it. I think we should make sure that we steer the money invested into energy transformation really with the focus to de decrease the maximum CO2 amount. And I believe this will drive us to use existing infrastructure to refurbish it, to modify it, also to take other gases like hydrogen going forward and having afterwards a setup by use also of some of the old assets. So it's possible um, in a different design, and it's also obviously something which will require a close discussion between all parties collaborating in the market. Thank you very much. And again, that is a, a, a remark that I will take with me into our hydrogen panel because the topic of, of the degree to which we can repurpose infrastructure for hydrogen is, of course, uh, currently uh, a, big, a big debate. Let me now shift us to the social question again because of uh, having an eye on the clock. And it was mentioned by both ministers earlier this morning, uh, both uh, Minister Herbock, uh, Baerbock and Minister Habeck, that in the aftermath of the pandemic, and as a result of the crisis in Ukraine, people everywhere are feeling the pain of rising energy prices, an inflationary spiral that is in fact also exacerbating global hunger. So it is obviously more crucial than ever that the energy transition really delivers benefits rather than additional burdens. So I'd like to ask uh, uh, several of you to just talk a little bit about what your country or institution is doing to work towards this aim. And if I may, I'm going to start with Vice Minister Mohina also to pick up on Egypt's role in coming in, uh, being designated president of COP27. Because we saw a fairly small share of the audience saying that more ambitious NDC would be a crucial driver, but we saw a very large share of the audience saying we need accelerated investments. And of course, the investments that are crucial for many countries are also investments in adaptation not simply in mitigation. And I know that this is a key focus for Egypt. So can you talk about that a little bit and link it also to the social side? Shukran gazilan. Yani al-haya Masr, al-sanadi, inshallah, sawfa tunazim, COP27, wa al-anwan al-raisi, wa al-target al-raisi li Masr, haza al-aam fi COP27, huwa al-binaa ala ma tamma tahqiqo fi Glasgow fi COP26. Bil-fa'al tamma l-intihaa min kafat al-mufawdat wa al-wusul ila al-nusus al-tafawdiyya fi Paris Agreement, lakin al-hadaf al-raisi fi COP27, inshallah, sawfa yakun al-tahawul min marhalat al-tafawd ila marhalat al-implementation. Deputy Minister, I'm not getting a translation. Are others in the room getting a translation? No? Okay. No. I'm going to come I, back to you. Yes. Maybe our translator... I, I will speak in is, English. Oh, you'll speak in English? Uh, yes, okay. no problem. Good. No problem. Thank you. Flexibility <laughs> yes. is everything in the energy... I'm sorry, the, the interpreter apologizes. So now there will be an interpretation into English. Egypt will organize uh, this year, by the end of this year, uh, COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And uh, the main title and the main target of COP27 will be the moving from negotiation to the uh, implementation. So we need uh, to put all... Uh, uh, all targets and all objectives of Glasgow and uh, all uh, uh, COPs, uh, in previous COPs, to be implemented in the near future. Uh, and also, you, uh, all of you know that Egypt will organize this COP on behalf of the uh, African continent. African continent is more vulnerable for, to the impacts of climate change. So we need to be balanced between mitigation and adaptation. Uh, so, yani, uh, if we if we look at the the, the uh, ambitious of the raising of renewable energy or implementing the clean energy in the in the African continent or especially in Egypt, we need to the more support from developed countries. The one of them may be financing. Uh, yani, as 
Uh, as I mentioned before, Egypt decided to exclude and eliminate cool uh, power plants from our strategy by 2035. Uh, can you predict uh, that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, power, uh, cool power plant is around 20, uh, 23 gigawatt from coal. If we replace this amount of, of coal power plant to be replaced by renewable energy, we need around 46 gigawatt from renewable energy, depending on the capacity factor of the, of the, uh, of the renewable energy. The amount of financing uh, need, uh, needed for that, around $50 uh, uh, billion dollar to, to invest in, in, in this amount of renewable energy by 2035. So we need uh, uh, more collaboration between North and South to, to support African continent and African countries f for two, uh, uh, two pillars and two paths. One of them, the uh, adaptation with the climate change, and also to support the African continent and African countries to uh, implement and to construct more and more from renewable energy capacities. Uh, uh, we need for that financing, we need capacity building, because if we mm -hmm. add more and more from renewable energy, the stability of grid will be uh, challenged. Uh, so we need capacity building, we need uh, technology transfer, we need uh, 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 electrical interconnection with Europe uh, grid, and so on. So the challenge is, more, uh, is, is, is big, but uh, with collaboration, with cooperation, we can uh, uh, face these challenges in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you also for your flexibility. Uh, the translator apologized. Uh, she was away from the microphone, I think. So let me now ask, we have about five minutes left, as I hear. So let me ask Minister Ben Ali and then Minister Aliou also to talk, if you would, about what your country is doing to take people along on this energy transition. And again, we heard our young uh, speakers at the end of the closing ceremony talking about the crucial impact also for young people. So talk Talk about that a little bit, if you would, please. I go first. Sure. Okay. I'll go Mr. first. Mr. Benelli, please. <laughs> sure. Sure. No, I think the... Uh, thank you very much for this question. I think it's a people-centric question is essential. And I, we heard it at the COP uh, in Glasgow, and we are hearing it today in Berlin. Um, and I think that's something that Siemens was, was saying but when they talk about societal challenge. We need to put a price tag on all this. It's unbearable but we need to put a price tag. So when I say um, that if you want us to flood the market with $2 hydrogen and equivalent of ammonia, we can do that. I mean, our one-stop shop here can definitely give you uh, the, the, the certificates of origin for a tradable green certificates for uh, green hydrogen, access to information on investment opportunities, etc., stable regulatory framework, etc., etc. We are already connected to Europe. Morocco is already has uh, a couple of electricity lines to Spain. We are working on a third one. We are also working on an interconnection with Portugal, potentially with the UK, and we also have a pipeline, a gas pipeline between Morocco and, and Spain. So we are already there in terms of connectivity. What it means now is that we need to put a price on all this, a price, sorry, on the negative externalities and, and a cost on those negative externalities, and hopefully some incentive incentives on a positive externalities for those who are able to accompany us in this energy transition. We like to do it discreetly, we like to do it efficiently, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm launching, I'm hearing really putting a call for, let's stop using colors, and our friend Francesco La Camera, I see it here, uh, if we can put, start to put some numbers, it will help the financial community uh, speak the same language as the policymakers, and it will enable us to push through those projects for the benefits of the people within Europe and within the countries that are at the outskirts of Europe who are playing a leading role in this energy transition. So we really want to utilize the underutilized or non-utilized infrastructure that we already have that was built in the 20th century to, to cater for 19th century fuels, I agree with you. But that comes with a, with a cost as well, and we have to internalize those, those costs. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll finish with the, the final word on, uh, on leapfrogging. We're always asked to leapfrog to uh, 
green hydrogen and green ammonia, definitely what we are trying to do is to rebuild our infrastructure, be it electricity systems, gas infrastructure, to enable them to be future-proofed for hydrogen and ammonia for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister Aliyu, please. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, moderator. Uh, yes, you have asked what uh, we are doing in our individual countries. Yeah, we have all been doing our own bits, but the approach should be well coordinated like this. And uh, what are we doing collectively? Uh, countries have their own challenges, uh, uh, peculiar to the, where they are. Uh, so with the coordinated global uh, action based on uh, uh, accord, Paris Accord and uh, 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 COP26, it's urgent now to do the renewable way more than ever before. Uh, however, however, we must not forget uh, the fact that uh, countries differ in the emission of uh, the carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, the richer countries emit more uh, of the carbon and they have enjoyed the benefit of that for over uh, two centuries. So, uh, for instance, my country, uh, emission is just uh, very infinitesimal, very small, uh, compared to the other countries per capita emission. So, I think uh, the rich countries should uh, look at the uh, smaller countries in terms of uh, uh, support to make them leapfrog, as uh, let me use her word, out yep. of the, 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 the present situation. Because most of these countries uh, have a lot of challenges, insecurity, uh, hunger, and uh, so many things like this. So it is only when you are out of this situation that you give more attention to other things like that. More so, uh, the fossil fuel that we are trying to outface is the source of income of some of these countries. Of course. And, uh, and that, that's the source of energy. For instance, my country, 80% of our generation comes from that. Yeah. Only 20% uh, comes from renewable, which we have a vision now Great. to increase uh, uh, to 30% renewable by 2030. And uh, the pathway that we have uh, developed but towards the uh, 2060 uh, net zero will require over $400 million. Where will this come from yeah. if we don't get support from multilaterals from other countries? So this is the way I want us to approach this. The richer countries should look upon the the smaller countries in terms of finances and support, right. uh, cons uh, uh, loans based on concessionary terms and, and things like that. Minister. To be able to carry everybody along. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, I think that is a very important note to end on. We did in fact hear from the German uh, foreign minister earlier saying there can be no national path in the uh, energy vendor, in the energy transition. It can only be accomplished internationally, globally with cooperation. And certainly uh, I know that will be a topic uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh also later on this year. So many, many thanks to all of you for being part of this panel. Thank you so much, Commissioner Simpson, for being with us uh, from Brussels. We very much appreciate uh, your joining us remotely. And uh, thank you for your very strong messages that we will take with us into our further discussions here at BETD 2022. And let's give them a warm round of applause.